Good evening. What you are about to see are the remarkable personal stories of people who survived one of the most terrible periods in history. The Holocaust is an event that still defies understanding. Though 50 years have passed, it's a story that must be told again and again. Chrysler Corporation is proud to be a part of bringing you the incredible and moving stories you are about to hear. They remind us how precious life is, how invaluable our freedoms are, and how important it is to hear the stories from the past to help prevent these atrocities from ever happening again. Listen now as the survivors tell their stories. Jewish life was like anywhere else in Europe. The people were mostly observant people. Holidays, observed the Sabbath, went to shul, kept kosher, most of them. There were grocery stores, restaurants. There was also a market and people used to put up stands to sell suits, shoes, all necessities for people's everyday life. You went to school, came home, made uh, homework, um, had to practice the, 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 the violin. We were lucky, you see, we had the season change. We have rain and snow, so what is the kid to do? You stay at the home, and what shall you do? You read a book, and that was a blessing. <laughs> we observed high holidays. I went to Hebrew school, would go to services, because I would see my friends there. We would light candles at Hanukkah, but other than that, we were very much assimilated. All we did is dancing, movies. We had a lot of friends, and they all came to my mother's house. My mother's house was always open for everybody. My dad worked as a salesman. He came home once a week. He left Monday and came back Friday. My mother took care of us. She was a good cook, good baker. She made her own uh, uh, challahs and uh, little breads for Friday night. She made the chicken soup. In 1933, Hitler came to power. And uh, when I went to school, they put me in the last row of the class because I was Jewish. After school, we could not play in the street because Jews were beaten up. We went to a big synagogue next to our house to make our homework, to play chess, to play ping pong, to do a little sport in the back of the temple, just not to be in the street. 
we couldn't go to parks. They started riding on the benches in 1935. They wrote on the benches, nicht für Juden, means not for Jews. They burned books. As a child, I said, books uh, for we learn from uh, what, what, what's happening, mad. Berlin became a very clean, proper city for a few months in 1936 when the Olympic Games were played in Germany. All of a sudden, from all the benches, from all the parks, the sign disappeared because there was a lot of people from all over the world coming. It was like nothing ever happened there. But uh, it came back, the uh, foreign people left, and uh, everything was uh, done again. When Hitler was speaking, and I saw him on the balcony, they went me shake when he came on the balcony. And after, when he went back, they were singing, Nach Hause, nach Hause, nach Hause gehen wir nicht. Und wenn der Führer spricht, that was, that, that's what they were singing. We don't go home, we don't go home, until the Führer speaks, and if he speaks, we still don't go home. So I said to myself, what is happening here? When Hitler came to power, he planted the fifth column, what they call it, you know, uh, they had a lot of Volksdeutsch, what they call Germans born in Poland. This were the easiest people for him to uh, organize. And they start uh, walking around calling, don't buy from Jews. This started about 1937, 36. And it was a problem. But uh, actually in Poland, there was always anti-Semitism, to be honest. On November 9th, 1938, in the morning, all of a sudden, we went out to school and we saw smoke and fire, and uh, they started to break in the windows. There were a lot of Jewish stores, and they took out the merchandise, and they started burning the synagogues. And a week later, I'm supposed to have my bar mitzvah. We cannot make it in a temple because the temple was burned down and broken. There was a little house in the back from the Gabbai, the, the person who takes care of the temple. He says, you can do it in my house. Tell your family to come. In one corner were the burnt Torah scrolls. They were laying on the floor. I, I did my bracha, and I did what I have to do for my bar mitzvah. The rabbi was standing, crying. So I'll be never to forget. Germans entered in the morning, September 1st, crossed the border without declaring the war. But the night before, they bombarded all Polish airports. For this reason, not one Polish airplane could go up and fight the Germans. I remember my mother waking us up and being in tears and said, the Germans have entered Holland and were at war. The, the fighting was over within days because the Germans just bombed and Holland capitulated. The Germans were gonna come into Paris. And when I saw the uniform, and when I saw that shade of gray green, it frightened me and I ran back to the house and I started to cry. When Hitler began to persecute us and separate us and marked us with, with armbands and, and, and stars of David. And when this happened, I felt a great deal of rejection. 
And I can remember saying and thinking to myself, why was I born Jewish? Racial laws almost immediately uh, took effect. We were ordered to wear first yellow armbands, which later turned into the yellow star. Once the German came in, everything changed overnight. Immediately, loudspeakers and posters all over, Jews cannot wear this doctor. Everybody who had office job, you know, I mean, government job is out. We couldn't go out too much on the street because they beat up the Jews all the time, and especially from the Hebrew school. When they saw us coming out or going in, and the word dirty Jew that was constantly screaming dirty Jew when they saw a Jew. I think it was the worst time because I was a young girl, 15 year old, and I needed friends and needed to go out, not to stay in the house constantly. The Germans announced that they needed 2,000 young men and they needed them with college educations, preferably fluent in two out of three languages, Russian, Lithuanian, and German, and that these people would be given a chance to do easy work, research at universities, and so on. And it sounded absolutely marvelous. So anybody who had any protectia, any pull, tried to get in those 2,000. And then the day came and they marched out the best and the brightest we had. And they took them to a place called the Ninth Fort, which was about 10 miles out of the city an old World War I Russian fortress. And this is where they were killing people. They were bringing in people there from Lithuania, but also from Germany and from France and from all over the place. And it wasn't anything sophisticated, just machine guns and bulldozers and so on. So they killed the 2,000. They were never seen again. The Warsaw Ghetto was formed, and they started putting people from all over. And we were told we're going to move to the war together. This was the beginning of 1940. The UNRWA told us to put in everything in suitcases. You couldn't take any furniture. You could only take what you could carry. They took us into this post office where the SS was staying. They took everything away, beat the hell out of us, and uh, told us to go. When we came into the war together, you saw already people dying in the street. It was not a nice picture, you know. If you put a half a million people in a ghetto and you don't give them, people that went to work, they took commandos, they called a commander, they took 200 people. They marched them out so at least they got food where they worked on the airfield, building airfields, uh, unloading train loads, you know, with ammunition, all kinds of things. And uh, the people that were in the ghetto, what can you do? Yeah, there's no work. The only rations they gave you, even my child couldn't survive. When the German occupied us, it was on a Passover evening. We were sitting around the table and my father was praying, blessing the wine, and the Germans were knocking at the window, shouting, Verfluchte Jude, and we just lowered our voices. We blew out the candles and we knew this is the beginning of the hell. We were ordered to get our belongings as little as possible and leave our homes. I thought, God, I wish I was a bird flying there because the bird was free, but I wasn't. They announced that all of the gold and silver and valuables and furs and radios, watches, clocks, all that had to be delivered within 72 hours. And they apparently felt that they weren't getting enough. So they decided to show us that they were serious about it. And what they did was they sent armed patrols to every corner house on every street. And out of every corner house, they took two men at random, shot them, and just let them lie there. And uh, we happened to live on a corner at that time. So they came to our house. They took out my grandfather and one of my uncles. And we heard shots, and we came out. And there were the two dead bodies. From a point of view of a kid, it was very boring. The adults would go to work, 
The kids would stay behind. There was really nothing for us to do. From time to time, there were actions when they would come and search through the ghetto and they would take people out. They would, came in and burned down the hospital that we had a couple of times. But in between the actions, which were totally unpredictable, as a kid, it was really very boring. You had to find things to do because days were long. And we played a lot of soccer. You know, you would go out on the field and try and pick up a team, and uh, I'd say, hey, where's Joey? And somebody would say, oh, Joey, didn't you know they took him away last Wednesday? And I'd say, oh, yeah, what a shame. You know, he was a good center forward. Now we have to find somebody else. When my sister was taken from Paris, they were taken to L'Hiver. They had something like 20,000 people in this hippodrome for five days without sanitation, without food, without anything. My sister was very beautiful, Sabine, and there was a young man who was a god that obviously fell in love with her. And through him, she was able to smuggle out a couple of letters. And a couple of, one of the letters was that she just saw my brother's beautiful blonde hair being shaved, my brother Henri's hair shaved. My mother had beautiful black hair, but wavy shaved and Sabine's hair was shaved and in the letter you could actually see the tears falling down and that they had been put in, in prisoner's uniform and this young man asked if he could marry my sister she was only 15 and my sister sure you get her out of that camp you have my blessings you can marry her by the time he went back to PTVA to get her. She was on her way to Auschwitz. There was a letter smuggled from Poland, and this letter said there is something terrible going on in Poland. They are building a camp in a small town called Auschwitzheim, Auschwitz. And we have the feeling something is built there that will help them to execute Jews in large amounts. I don't know how many people there were, but uh, we were packed in like herrings, practically. Just, I mean, it was just suffocating, hot, smelly. You had your bathroom right there. You didn't go out. They didn't ever open the doors. It took a total of three days and two nights, and somebody was screaming that somebody died or something, and they still didn't open the doors. So it, it was just a horrible trip that I, I, I want to forget. I can't, I don't want to forget, but I want to forget. There came trucks, and they start throwing in bread into the trucks. And whoever grabbed the bread, you know, if you're lucky, you were hiding it, you could save it. There was a father and a son next to me, and the father g got a hold of a brat. And the son was about my age. He was a little, still a little bit strong, stronger than the father. And he wanted the brat from the father. So he's trying to grab the brat, but the father didn't want to give away the brat. You would think a father would share with the, with the son. And the son kept on hitting the father so hard until he killed the father so he can take the bread away from the father. I had just turned 18, and I was looking out how free the world is. My father was an extremely smart man. I taught to him in the ghetto I was sitting there, and I thought, Daddy, what's gonna happen? I thought, I'm after all, you know. And he always assured me, don't worry. This is the 20th century. <laughs> They're not gonna kill us. After three days and three nights, the door opened up, you know. Raus! Four o'clock in the morning, Birkenau, the ramp. Raus, so schnell wie möglich, raus! At that moment, you thought, we thought we were in hell. 
thousands of people were pouring out of this train. The train had no end. I couldn't see the end of it. And there was tremendous chaos. Children looking for parents and mothers calling their children's names. It was impossible to find anybody. I was holding on to my mother's hand and we were walking together. She was carrying my brother. Suddenly, a whip came down on my hand. I was pulled away from my mother, and she was shoved in a different direction. I started screaming, I want my mother. I want to go with my mother. There was uh, one person, looked like a ranked German with high rank, and he was telling you, you go to the, this side, you go to this side, and so on. And, and uh, later on, we found out the left side meant, uh, uh, or one side meant uh, life, the other side meant the uh, um, death camp. I see my grandfather standing there from far away, and I said, Opa. And he hit me. Helmut. He didn't, he didn't think I was coming with him. He didn't. He, he said, Helmut, wo bist du wo, Helmut? I got near to him. I put my arms around him. I pressed him against me. I said, Opa, I'm here. He said, Helmut. My Helmut. He was a man. He must have weighed 45 kilos. I, that moment of strength, what I gave to him, was for me the bitter satisfaction of my life. We were taken into an underground dressing room. And here, surrounded by Nazi soldiers and vicious dogs that were growling and barking at us, we were told we should get undressed, we're going to take a shower. And of course, and nobody moved. So one of the soldiers walked over to one of these women and hit her and said, take it off. We came out naked on the other side of the shower room and stood there wet, naked from mid-afternoon till about midnight. I remember my sister and I hugging each other for a little body wound. We were freezing. And then at midnight, they took us into this barrack where they shaved our heads, our bodies. They sprayed us with DDT, with pesticide. And then we walked through a door where two prisoners greeted us. One gave us a recycled dress. And another prisoner had a bucket of yellow paint and a brush about four inches wide and painted a yellow streak from the top of our shaved head down through our back. This was the identification of being a Jewish prisoner. They pressed the number into my left arm. At that moment, when you get that pressed into you, your dignity, you felt so undignified, you felt so un unpractical. You, you, in that moment, you felt, I felt I, no, I was nobody anymore. Because he said to us afterwards, my God, now this is, when you asked your name, this is your number. We were introduced to this overseer who was a capo. You know, all the overseers were called capos in, in the camp. She was a Jewish uh, Slovakian girl. And uh, I asked this capo, when are we going to be reunited with our parents? And she pointed to one of the chimneys of the crematoria, and she said, do you see this chimney? I said, yes. She says, there go your parents. And when you'll be re when you'll go through the chimneys, you'll be reunited. I looked up to the sky. I saw the stars. And I counted each star, one of my family. I said, this is my opa, this is my oma, this is my sister. One of the Polish girls in the barrack started to sing Yiddish. And she was singing the song, My Yiddish Mama. And I remember we all cried through the whole night. 
Arbeit macht frei. Work makes free. And the interesting thing, the first thing I saw was there was entrance. I never saw a sign which said exit. Either it was very hot that you were faint, or it was bitter cold. And you know, we didn't we were not we didn't have so we would hold on to each other and our bodies would one would warm the other. We were jammed in. We could sleep never. We could never sleep. But we constantly fought to just stretch a little bit an arm or a leg because we couldn't move. When we woke up 4 o'clock, there was always we selected a few to go pick up the food for us. We were getting like a a soup. It's a little watery uh, with some grass in it. You could feel the sand under it. We'd go to work six or seven o'clock in the morning. I think we got either a piece of bread in the morning and a bowl of soup when we came back from work. And we worked 12 hours. And we just slept on bare wood, there was no blankets or pillows or anything. And there was no sanitary, there was no water, there was no soap. You were allowed to go wash up once quickly, once a day, and that was it. Before you went to sleep, they used to dig holes outside. You wake up in the morning, the holes were fill, filled up. They used to kill people at night, they used to take them out and for nothing. You see a lot of people a lot of people, you, I was young, so I could take it. A lot of people, they was older, they was in the camps. He couldn't walk no more to work. You know, you don't, they don't need you there. They shot you for nothing. When you woke up in the morning, you had to stand outside. For hours, they were, it seemed like for hours, they were counting. Counting, counting, counting. And finally, the tally was added up. Then they reported to a higher rank German that all is accounted for. But this took hours of counting and freezing cold, it, and were, or very hot, they just didn't care. Guards were drunk all the time. Guards couldn't count, which means you had to stand for hours and hours and hours because they were too stupid to count. They played the Russian roulette there, not with a gun. It would have been too simple. They lined you up for the famous appeal to be counted. And then one of the guards who had perhaps a bad night or no night at all would say, every second, every force, every f out into the gas chambers. They marched us in that big room. We had to get undressed completely naked. And then they took us in the room with the horse in the ceiling. See, when they guessed, they let Cyclone be gas through. 
they told us to sit on the floor. There was no window. The doors were closed. So we started to, to cough and to choke. And probably from lack of air, we dozed off. And then, I don't know how long we were in, but then they started yelling out, everybody out. What happened is really a miracle. That day, they had trouble with the letting the uh, gas through. I didn't know the danger I was in, and I walked over a little bridge, and a man was standing on the door. Von der Sonne. Und da went halt in der, said, was ist das du? Sag, komm mal ran hier, sucht er, du bist hier in der Gaskammer. Sag ich, in der Gaskammer? I was at the back. Because they came in from the front, they went through the, uh, to the hall, where they had to put off their clothes, that I know now. They had to hang the clothes on, they had hangers there. It says there, you're going to take showers, sit down, take it easy. The SS was standing there, taking kids on their arms. And then he said, 10, 15 minutes, you hear them shrying and shouting. And, and after 10, 15 minutes, he said, they open the door again, it's finished. Nobody. And then you see all the strong people on top and all the weak people on the bottom. And the strong ones on the top, he says, they have stomachs full of air or something. You see people with scratched on the walls because they want to get on top of each other. The, the last death fight, you know, the fight for, uh, against the death. An SS came to our barrack holding up a violin. And he announced, whoever can play the violin to come to the front room. And I will give to the one who plays to my liking, I will give you food and water. The violin was given to the oldest one among us. And I have never in my life heard anyone ever so beautiful play. But the SS didn't like his play. So he motioned the couple. One couple took the violin out of this wonderful violinist's hand. The other one picked up a heavy iron pipe and went from behind and smashed his head so hard that he, he broke his skull and blood and brains splattered all over the floor. I tried to sneak back in the barrack, but yet a third couple grabbed me and forced me right in the middle of the floor, gave me the violin and says, Spiel, play. Here, that's what came out of the instrument. the SS held up his hand and started to beat the rhythm. Because I played the Blue Dan, it was in three-quarter time. So he was beating and then he said, hold it. Now, from that time on, right there and then, I could play anything that I wanted. But here is a question. I'm going to tell you something that you're not going to believe. I have never played a blue Danube in my life before. Never. I saw sadism, cruelty from the Germans and anyone that had a higher rank, whether it was a prisoner himself, but he had to show to the Germans that uh, I'm doing what you might want me to do and so on. I saw a lot of cruelty. Uh, I, I never thought that people can handle people, other people like that. My job was to go and pick up the dead and cart them up to the crematoria, where another group of Zonda commandos would shove them in the oven. On one occasion, I picked up one of the men who was on the floor, and I hear a voice saying, oh, please give me water. Oh, please give me water. And I look around and see who, who, where it came from? Who said that? And the, the man, I noticed them. Well, this is the man I just picked up. 
immediately I went to the capo. I said, Ham Capo, Mr. Capo, this man I just picked up and put him on the card. He's not dead at all. In fact, if we would, and he's asking for water, and if we would give him water and a little food, he could s survive and he could come to himself and uh, it would be very useful because he could go to work. So when we arrived to the crematorium, this couple made me, forced me to be the one who shoves this man into the oven and burn him. And I had to comply with his wish or else I'll be in it. Now, I have never lived that through. To these days, sometimes I wake up during the night screaming and I'm seeing seeing this man and hearing his cry and I had to burn him. They sang the Atikva in the gas chamber. And we hear that because that camp was not far from the crematoriums. And it was so cold. And it was so lonely. You could hear a pin fall, you know. And we hear them sing the Atikva. The praying from crematorium from the fire, it goes in the, in, in, in you, you hear it every time. Shema Yisrael, God, where are you? Where is the promises? Why? I, I'm a religious man. I believe in you. And this, you know, you never forget in your life. It was the Passover of 1945. We might be liberated at any time, except the Germans don't allow camps to be liberated uh, with inmates still in place. They usually either kill off the camp or they march them towards the inside of Germany. And we heard rumors of these so-called death marches, which really indeed were death marches. So we decided with my father that from that really, truly meager portion of bread that what we were receiving in the camp, every day we are going to slice off a tiny, tiny piece and we are going to save it up for the march. Now one day I came in from work and my father sat me down and said, now I hope that you will understand what I'm about to tell you. You won't like it, but you will understand it, I'm sure. I gave away all the bread we saved because a small new transport arrived to the camp. And I found out that one of the men somehow managed to smuggle in a prayer book, an old small prayer book. He smuggled in. It, it was unbelievable. And I bought it. I gave him all the bread we saved up. I started to cry. A few days later, it happened to be Passover night. My father held a Seder, because this little book contained the entire Haggadah. And I will never ever forget the scene. There were hundreds of inmates sitting on the bunks on the floor in silence, listening my father reading the Haggadah from the beginning. And I'm sure that This instilled some hope and courage and added a little extra strength to these people. How can I forget Auschwitz, Majdanek, Bergen-Belsen, Theresienstadt, Buchenwald, Krakow, Kshanov, Warsaw, Gross Rosen, Babiaf, Ravensburg, Riga, Sachsenhausen, Blechhammer, Brande, Greditz, Faulburg, Langenbilau, 
Treblinka, and so many others. How can I forget Moishe Yankel and Rivka, Hans Gretchen, Michel Robert, Hendrik, and so many names. And I hear so many Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. How can I forget the sound of shovels in the wind that carries the endless sound of Yiskadal v'Yiskada Shemei Rabah? It is so much pain to remember, so much pain, but it's so hard to forget. The Germans asked us to start digging our graves. And they told us, you dirty Jews, you're not going to escape. We're going to shoot you before we leave. And so we dug our graves, and every day we weren't sure when will be our last day. And one day we went to sleep, and the next morning we got up, and there was no wake-up call. And we went up, and there were no Germans around. And it was a beautiful day. We realized that the guards have, had left. The gates were locked and they were electrified. So we started to dig a ditch under the gate. And since I was the youngest, I got out first. Um, it was a beautiful day and you know, birds were chirping and the, the flowers were out. And to walk alone and not to have to walk in, in line with, with guards around us, it was some glorious feeling. The German peasants started to seed potatoes and they opened these potato heaps on the fields. We went there and stole what we could, putting it on our back in some, some textile and always with these bags we marched through the streets. It was our greatest fortune. I thought that if my parents didn't make it, I don't want to live. I didn't know how. Everything was being done for me until the war, and I just didn't know how. They took a bunch of young kids to camp. And when we were liberated, we were older, but we didn't learn anything from life. I mean, we didn't mature, uh, grow up. It still felt like you were only 15 when you first got there. We were weak, we were disoriented, everybody was, was running. I remember my mother looking for my, my father. Somebody said that there was, I don't know how she traveled there, she went to Prague. That there might be somebody who had seen perhaps my father, who knows of him where, you know, of if he... I mean, everybody was, it was crazy. Much sadness came, because the list of people were coming back and we were searching for our loved ones. And every time the names were so similar, it was so painful, the dates. And you looked and you looked and you looked and you went and you searched and you asked people, did you, in fact, know this one? Did you know that one? Somebody said that they saw my brother in Auschwitz and that he was shot because he wouldn't put my mother in the oven. If it's true, I hope he died. I hope it's true. Mothers was looking for children, children for mothers, and fathers for wives and sisters. I, I was looking for my family, looking for my friends, and there's nobody survived. When I came back to Germany after the war, I was going around just looking for trouble. A few boys like me was healthy and we took revenge. I used to knock the hell out of them. They used to call Judenschlagen, Jewish, Jewish people are killing us. So, so you kill us too. Yeah, I, I take revenge a little bit for them. I used to tell them, this is for my mother, this is for my father, this is for my sister and brother. I used to give them the business. 
The pain is real. The pain is not a fiction. I wish it were a fiction. I wish somebody would come back and give me back my family and say, hey, it never happened. Here they are. But they aren't here. We went over the border to Germany, the DP camp. And uh, we registered in the DP camp and avoiding to uh, register to come to United States or to Australia or to Canada or to Israel, whatever comes first. We are here in the Where can answer and me? Via him soll ich gehen, ist verschlossen jeden Tier. To the left, to the right, it's the same in every In 1947, in December, when the United Nations declared that Israel will be a state, people that we lost everything. This was the, our, this was the most important thing that I was able to think about it, that I'll be in my own country. I'll be a soldier, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be somebody strong. We are here Ist verschlossen jedem Tier. Es ist die Welt groß genug. Nur Familien sind und klein. Wie ein Blick muss zurück. Es ist zu stört jede Brücke. Twelve million men, women and children have died murdered in cold blood. Millions upon millions more today mourn their fathers and their mothers, their husbands, their wives and their children. What rights has any man to mercy? who has played a part, however indirectly, in such a crime. Fifty years. I lived fifty years after that. Can you, can anybody even believe that it'd be possible to live fifty more years with such awesomeness? with that knowledge. I felt I had a life. I, some, something owed me a life. I know planned Earth and owe me a living, but I wanted a life. I thought if I marry an American, American roots, American family, American children, I'll be American. I will find the roots. I was, I was, I, I was, I didn't want to live. I had guilty feelings. Why did I remain alive and not one of my brothers? Or not my younger brother, one immediately younger? I go back to my childhood. I always search it. I search it because half of my body is always there. I think if the last Holocaust survivor dies and is not here anymore, all these people will find the rest and their peace. The, the six million, they will suddenly come to, to peace because they are not in peace yet. Because then they know when we are not here anymore that we have given the message. And the young people have to continue, but then they will find their rest. I felt in my heart that any little thing that was done for me, and I don't mean uh, materially or financially or anything, a 
kind words meant so much to me. They're nice to me. You must always be involved. Don't ignore it by thinking, well, this is the other guy and I cannot be involved. I would say you have to be involved because if not, God forbid, the same thing can happen again. No matter how wonderful the country, it only need, you only need a couple of people that start spreading rumors and the whole darn thing can, can, can come tumbling worse than an earthquake. Don't hate anybody. Just don't hate anybody because look what happened from, from the hatred. Because somebody has a different religion or different race or you shouldn't look at that. You should look for the person, the human being, what is inside. I think the most important thing is we've learned that life is precious. And that goes, that's something that stays with you all the time. I cheer at Hitler and his henchmen. And this, what I got right now here, a lovely family, my wife and my kids. And this is the happiest moment of my life because I unloaded everything on tape. Maybe I'm not going to be so crazy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Fifty years later, there is still so much that we can learn from the people who witnessed and lived through the Holocaust. Lessons about life and hope and the devastation that can come from intolerance. The interviews you've just seen are only a glimpse into the first testimonies collected by the survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation. Shoah is the Hebrew word for Holocaust. And this nonprofit foundation has been established to videotape tens of thousands of interviews with Holocaust survivors, conducting interviews around the world, around the clock, in every language. The foundation is not only assembling an invaluable historical archive, it's using breakthrough computer technology to revolutionize how history and culture of tolerance can be taught and learned for generations to come. And long after the last survivors are gone, they'll still be able to speak with us and we'll still be able to learn from them. The devastating events of the Holocaust didn't happen to faceless numbers. They happened to people, just like the ones you've seen and heard from. Men and women and children with names and faces and families and dreams. People just like us. Listening to them, it's our hope that we can bring attention to the lessons of tolerance and understanding for now and for our future.